Uh, next week, we're going to finish up our Second Thessalonians series. Uh, so, but for this morning, I have a different topic we're going to go over today. Uh, this morning, I want to answer the question, what would you do if you came back from torment? I want you to imagine a scenario where uh, you die. You go to the place referenced in, uh, in Luke chapter 16, verse 23, as torment. And then you get to come back to earth for a second try, second chance. So you die, you spend time in this awful place, having missed the mark. And then in our scenario today, you get an opportunity to uh, try again and come back to earth. What would you do differently if you missed the mark? And you came back from this awful place after experiencing what the punishment really was like for a short time. How would your life change after you realize fully what awaits you in eternity? How would your priorities change in life? How would your decisions change if this happened to you? So that's kind of the question and thought I want to talk about in our lesson this morning. Uh, now, of course, biblically, we understand fully that it is not possible to get a second chance after being sent to torment. So I'll make that clear up front. Uh, this is uh, just meant to be a sermon to get us thinking. And it doesn't happen uh, the way some people say, oh, I went here and I suffered and I came back. Uh, they didn't. Okay, uh, that, that, that's, that's a lie. And so this is just something to be thought-provoking. Uh, so even though there is no coming back from this awful place, it's good to talk to the living about how horrific it would be uh, so that we can be motivated ourselves not to go there. We don't want anybody to go to a place like this. And we need to try to save lost souls who are headed in that direction. But yes, after a person dies, no one gets sent to the place of punishment, which you read about in Acts 16, and then gets to come back. God uh, just has not set it up that way. The verdict of either paradise or torment uh, is a final verdict after you die. And the two places are separated by a great gulf fixed through which there can be no crossing of this gulf. Once the soul ends up in torments, the, ver the verdict of punishment is theirs forever. So as we start, I suppose it would be advantageous for us to read through the section of Scripture that talks about torments versus uh, paradise to kind of set the tone for the discussion. So here is the actual story that Jesus gave us. You know, I guess the pulling behind of the curtain so we could see into this next realm is uh, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, we're going to read. Two actual men, two actual verdicts after death. Jesus reveals the outcome of these two individuals. So he says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. That's while he was on the earth. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at the rich man's gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And here it is, being in torment in Hades. Hades, of course, uh, is the generic term for the waiting place of the dead. There's the righteous side and the wicked side, but those who die and we, they await the judgment day to be resurrected again. And being in to the torment part of Hades, the rich man lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Uh, then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus received evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Verse 26, And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you, if we wanted to help you out, we can't. Nor can those from there pass to us. <coughs> then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house then. If you can't come to me, send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets... 
neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. So simply reading this story, here are a few things that we can easily come to know. Uh, the holding place for the wicked as they begin their punishment is a place that you and I do not want to end up in, right? First and foremost, uh, you know, if you believe that this place is real, if you believe God's word and the promise of the punishment upon the wicked, then we really see just a clear picture here of what awaits us if we fail the spiritual test that we're taking right now in unfaithfulness to God. Don't let it happen to you because it doesn't have to happen. We've got the answers right here. We have full salvation available for us. We don't have to go to this place we're talking about. So again, I want you to imagine that you, you visit this place, but only for a short time. And you experience firsthand what awaits all the wicked after death, and then you come back. So let's say you're just driving down the road. You're on your way home after this morning's church service. And you get struck by an oncoming car who wasn't paying attention. And this very day, you die. Your spirit leaves your body. And the spirit, your spirit leaves this earth. And just like in the account in Luke chapter 16, which we just read, only moments before, perhaps you being present with your family, in there with the in the car with you here on the earth, in the blink of an eye, your life is just taken from the earth, and you end up in the place of punishment, if you uh, are like the rich man in this story. So the story says the rich man died and woke up, being in torments in Hades. Again, you were just here; life was just as normal as it could be. But now, just like that, you are in a place of blackness, a place of darkness, and you realize how fragile your life on the earth really was this whole time, that it was a blessing that you were here. Describing the future abode of punishment known in the Greek as Gehenna, that's hell as we know it, the final abode for the wicked after the judgment day. The Bible says about that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So you wake up and you're in this place of darkness. You, you've in, been entirely separated from God and all things that are good. You feel alone. You feel very scared. And you feel a great sense of dread. And all happiness seems to have been ripped from your soul. And there's a flame in this place. Like a furnace that burns hot. And you are already in excruciating agony in this place of torments. So you've just been there for moments. And you already want out. You're thirsty. You're in pain, and immediately you long for relief, but you get none. I've heard preachers say, uh, if, if someone could look into the true place of punishment just for a moment, it would be enough to make them change their whole life around instantly. If you could just experience the other side of this, if you could only see this terrible place. But you see, the reason God has written this story down for us and preserved it in writing uh, so that we wouldn't have to visit this place firsthand. And we could visit it through the means of the rich man. And we can learn from his verdict so that we don't have to go there. You know, someone talks to me about torments and flames and darkness and agony and sorrow and sadness. Then I'll tell you one thing. I'll believe you that this is a place I don't want to go. I don't, I don't have to go there to realize that I don't want to go there. You, you can use those words. I get it. But in our scenario, you know, I, I, don't know, I don't know how long you want to suffer in this place. Let's just say, hypothetically, you, you, you're here for an hour. You're in Hades for one hour in this terrible flame. And that seems like more than enough time to get the point across, doesn't it? You probably wouldn't even need that much time. And you spend one hour in torments, and that hour already feels like an eternity. And you think, man, I've been here ten days. No, you, you're only there one hour. So you experience what it's life and you want out so badly. Then all of a sudden, you get to come back. And you've experienced this full punishment, of which we really can't go into much more detail than what we've already talked about, but it's gonna, it would be awful. You experience it. And again, just to re-clarify, we know that this kind of stuff doesn't actually happen other than when Jesus would raise someone from the dead, but usually who he would raise are people who are already in paradise. But we know that because Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, it is only appointed for men to die once, and after this, the judgment. So men don't come back from torments uh, as we're drawing out 
here today. But for the illustration, you get to come back to Earth after spending one hour. Okay, well, what's your first step after that? What do you start thinking? First, you get this relief of like, I can't believe I'm out of that place. How did I get out of that place? How will your life change, though, now that you've experienced what's waiting? Your life's going to change, isn't it? If you're smart, if you don't want to go back to that terrible place. So I have seven thoughts for you this morning uh, that would probably come to your mind if that happened to you and you came back and you're back in this position, you're here on the earth, what would you be thinking? Well, thought number one. So we got seven thoughts this morning. Number one, I must reevaluate my whole life. We got to start from scratch. If, if you went to torments and you came back, that would be a surefire way of knowing no pun intended with the fire, surefire way of knowing that you're not in the right relationship with God. If I, made, if I went to torments, that meant I didn't, I didn't make it. Something was wrong. I'm getting a second chance. Odds are you were part of a church, probably. Then you'd probably second guess everything about the church you were in, first and foremost. Is, is, is it the church of the Bible that I was following? Was I following the right? I wasn't following the right way then, was I? Maybe not. Does this church actually teach the truth where I'm at? What area are they possibly leading me astray in to where I ended up here? By the way, all these questions we're going to go over today are questions that we should be asking anyway about our church, wherever we attend. For others, perhaps they didn't take uh, spiritual things very seriously in life, and they never really attended church. Odds are, after this, Spiritual gatherings with teaching and instruction would become a very high priority in your life if this just happened to you. And you would, you would be wanting to come to church. You've got to figure out which church to go to, though, right? I bet the person who comes back from Hades would have some questions for some preachers. You know, a lot of times people come to me with many, many questions. That would be the person who would have probably 100 questions to ask any preacher in town all of a sudden, they become the best student of the Bible anyone's ever known. You're taking it seriously now. I know if I was sent uh, from torments and I came back, I, I'd start following the command from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. The verse says, test all things. Hold fast to what is good. That is, I mean, I'd be asking my preacher, now hold on. You know, what is this you've been teaching me all this time? You told me how to get saved. Did anyone get saved in that manner in Scripture? Is that how they got saved back then? Do you have a book, chapter, and verse for the things you're teaching from the pulpit? I want you to prove. I want to prove that you're, that you're teaching what the Bible says. Yes, odds are you might be a little bit upset with your preacher at the church where you attended if he relayed you false information. Because he was the guy claiming to be preaching about the right answers. And because of his preaching, because he taught you wrong, and the church that you were a part of taught you wrong, you ended up in this place of torment. Because it's only the truth that's going to save you. And if they weren't preaching the truth, you're not going to be saved. You'd uh, learn not to take your preacher's word for it anymore, but put him to the test with Scripture. And that's what we encourage you to do here. If the preacher, right now, that's myself, gets up here and preaches something spiritual regarding salvation and eternal life, and living the Christian life, the Bible says you are to put that preacher every single time to the test. Make sure that what he's saying is in Scripture. Put to the test the things that your parents taught you. Put to the test everything and compare it with Scripture. Someone might even take a step back even further and reevaluate re that they are even in the correct world religion. You know, a practicing Christian would have a right to ask the question, now, before I start re-dissecting Christianity, can I study to be sure that Christianity is actually the way to heaven? Sure, ask those questions. Mary, those are some good questions. Start from scratch. Ask all the questions. Search for the truth. And those are good questions, and when you start seeking for the truth, you will get to the bottom of it, the Bible says. You'll find that when you start asking these questions and getting the answer to these questions as you study, uh, your faith is built up because you've asked the good questions and you become pre more prepared than you were before because you're thinking about these things. All right, thought number two 
is another logical declaration. I must take this more seriously. Evidently, I wasn't taking it seriously enough because I ended up in the place of torment. The person in our scenario would say, you know, before I fully contemplated the punishment, I, I didn't think about the punishment. Thinking about spiritual things in life was really just a very small portion of my life. I didn't do it very much. I didn't put very much effort or energy into it. I didn't take eternity very seriously. But you know what? Now I'm going to take it seriously. Now it's, it's, it's not just going to be part of my life. It's going to be my whole life. Reminds me of Colossians 3 and verse 14. Paul said to Christians who were making Christ their number one priority, listen to the wording. It says, when Christ, who is our life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. I love that phrase. Christ, who is your life, he's your whole life. That is, Christians, that's all you think about. Now, that's all you do. You obs- you're, you're obsessing over following Jesus. And you know, if you really were a person who came back from the dead and got to experience the punishment I bet all your friends, all your family and neighbors would say, man, brother so-and-so just got real religious all of a sudden. I don't remember Travis talking about spiritual things that much before. But all of a sudden, sudden something changed. Travis is obsessed with the Bible and religion and studying and teaching people. And he's all about that now. He wasn't before. What changed? Contemplated the, the punishment. And you know what we'd have to say to, uh, to our friends and neighbors who would say, well, you're, you're obsessed over this. You know what I'd say to someone if, if I really spent an hour in torments and they said I'm obsessed over that? I'd say, I don't care. You know, that could have been one of the points up here. I, I, I do not care any longer what people think. I only care what God thinks and helping myself get to heaven and, and you get to heaven. If you've got a problem with that, I, I don't really care. Right? Uh, no longer am I going to live my life worried if people are going to like me or if this is going to offend them. No longer am I going to live my life concerned if others are going to make fun of it. I don't care. I'm after the home in heaven and I don't care what others say about me and us if, as we're pursuing it. It's, uh, it's too high of a price to pay. And that's the way we need to live our lives anyway, Right? We don't have to go to this place of torment, so we should have that mindset already. It was Jesus who said, Matthew 16, 25, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What's he saying? So many people ponder Christianity and serving Christ and say, I don't really see this as the most important thing in my life. It's part of my life. It's not really number one in my life. I still want to make sure, most of all, that I'm enjoying life. That's the most important. Make sure you're enjoying this. Uh, and, and that I'm having fun and experiencing new things and traveling and seeing people. I just, I just enjoy the things of life too much to just go all in on Jesus Christ. I love getting to live this life and I enjoy it. But Jesus said, if you're going into following me with this mindset, you're not going to make it. You'll fail. Because it's not enough. You would get so distracted by the other things. You're trying to save access to the life that you're living and you want to enjoy your blessings now only. But you need to pursue the blessing giver. And you'll have plenty more where that came from when you make it to heaven. You get your enjoyment up there, okay? Not that God doesn't want us to have any enjoyment down here. But if you're going to think like this, well, enjoying life uh, here on the earth is most important to me. And thinking about eternity all the time, serving Jesus kind of puts a damper on the life I'm trying to live, people say. Jesus said, with that attitude, you won't make it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. As a matter of fact, the rich man who wound up in the place of torments in Hades that we've been reading about really had that exact mindset that we're talking about. Well, following God isn't super important to me. Evidently, it wasn't. All right, what's, what's important to me is pleasure and, and fun on the earth. It's all about being happy. That's what everybody out there says. As long as, you, as long as you're happy, you do whatever you want to do. But what if you're happy and you end up in torment? The point is about these type of people who are lost is, is that they try to cling to their life on the earth. They love their life, which God blessed them with that life in the first place. 
And if you go to torments and you think about the life that you had, you wish you had it back and you wish you had honored God who gave you that life in the first place. They wanted life to be solely about their enjoyment and comfort and pleasure, but they weren't willing to do anything uncomfortable for God who gave them their life. And in truth, they lacked courage to do the things God was asking them to do, which some of the things he's asking us to do are hard. Because, by the way, we're taking a test right now as we're alive on the earth. This isn't meant to be the reward. The reward comes after the test. And so those who won't put themselves out there at all, the Bible calls cowards. Revelation 21 verse 8 says that the cowards, the fearful, will have their part in the lake of fire. You won't make it if, you're not, if you don't have some courage. People with no conviction don't make it to heaven. People with no conviction to follow God at all costs won't make it to heaven. And these people are cowards. We can't let that be, define us. Uh, and we live life for ourselves and not for God. Next, thought number three regarding the individual who escapes the dreadful torments and comes back. He would say, well, now I must make sure I learn the truth. I don't merely want to hear words of comfort that's just going to make me feel good. I don't want to sit at the feet of preachers who tickle my ear and tell me I'm going to heaven no matter what I do. I want the truth now because the truth is what's going to help me go to heaven. Tell it to me then plainly. If there's something I need to fix, then you tell me what I need to fix. That's what I want to know. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I'd rather know I'm going to hell than to someone pretend I'm going to heaven and I don't actually make it. Talking about the truth, Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth, Father. Your word is truth. And so we, we learn about the truth. It's written down in God's holy word. He just told us exactly the way things are. We can read it. We can understand. And we've talked about how the Bible is essentially a spiritual mirror. You can see where you're going. You can look into it. And the Bible makes it pretty simple. It takes honesty. Opening up God's word with an honest heart. I have to work at it a little bit. I understand what it's saying. I'm, and, and I'm not trying to read this word to justify myself when I've done wrong. Some people read the word of God trying to make it say that their wicked living is acceptable. They go into it wanting it to say something, but we can't have that way. But, but instead, we approach God's word ready for it to show us guilt ready for it to point out what things we have to fix in order to go to heaven. John chapter 3 and verse 19 said, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. Right, And that's kind of the, 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 even the information about truth and righteousness and, and how you are evil. This, is, this information's come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So you see, when we start reading God's word, understanding your soul is on the line in reading this book. If you're going to be honest with it or dishonest, you're going to start reading it differently. You're going to start taking it seriously. Some people reading it say, oh, I'm, I'm saved no matter what. Now let me read about how I'm saved no matter what. That's how they go into reading their Bible. But others read their Bible saying, I'm going to read this Bible and I'm going to find out what's making me lost and I'm going to fix it. Now I'm going to make sure I'm saved. And that's what the Bible's for. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 says about this book, study to show yourself approved unto God. What are you studying for? To make sure I'm approved unto God. Make sure I'm going to be acceptable in God's sight. A worker, you're going to have to work at this, who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you're going to have to spend some time in this book? Yes, you are. We got to know, the, we got to make sure we got the truth. I'm reading this book. I'm pursuing God. Understanding that this book is God's instructions for how I need to live to be pleasing to him and make it to heaven. Therefore, whatever it says, I've got to be honest with it. I must dig into this every day for the rest of my life and take it seriously. Honor God, love God. In John uh, chapter 12, and verse 48, Jesus spoke in this way. He said, uh, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. The word will judge him. Jesus' words will judge you. Jesus' words will judge me. And when I realize that this is a book about the criteria for why my soul is lost or saved, 
then I'm going to start reading, not like it's some dead, boring old book. I'm going to start reading it as it is in truth, the power of God to convince us and save us. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the word of God is actually living in this sense and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So listen, in our scenario today, you wound up in torment because you were not right in God's sight for some reason. God's word tells us all the areas where we are wrong and how to fix them. But a lot of people don't read their Bibles that way. A lot of people read their Bible trying to prove to themselves why they're already right. But an honest soul will, will read God's word trying to truthfully see where they are wrong in life and where they can fix it. For example, the Bible says fornication is a sin. The Bible says drunkenness is a sin. I'll, you know, Go through the list of sins. Therefore, if I'm serious about my soul, logically, I'm going to stop pursuing sin A, sin B, fornication, drunkenness, or whatever you plug in there, because the Bible tells me it's condemned. And so I need to be faithful to the laws of God after I've obeyed the gospel. So all principles are written down as God's judging criteria. He's going to judge us by these specific things written in his law that we have to repent of and try harder at. So number one, I must reevaluate everything I've ever been taught. Number two, I must uh, take this way more seriously than I did before because my very soul is on the line here. Now I realize that. Number three, I've got to find the truth. I must learn what God says and how, how, about how to get to heaven, how to be right with him. I've got to actually listen to what the Bible is saying now. I, I didn't take it seriously enough before. By the way, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says that souls were saved when? When they obeyed the truth. You have purified your souls in obeying the truth, it said. So the only way to be purified, leading to life, is to find the truth, obey that truth, and then live in that truth the rest of your life until the day you die. Not that you have to be perfect. We talk about faithfulness all the time. But luckily, we have the truth, and it's found in God's Word. We have access to it. So we're, we're sitting good because we, we know what book to look to. Number four, the person who comes back from torments would very logically say this next. I must find the one true church of the Bible. You know, if you do start reading your New Testament, looking at it honestly with your soul on the line, it won't be too hard to realize there's only one church when you start re reading it. Because that's what it said. Acts 2.47 talks about when people started accessing remission of sins after Jesus' death. And it says, and The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So he would save somebody spiritually. They'd be located in his realm of safety known as the church. How many churches were there? There was one church. And still that way. Well, one thing noteworthy is that Scripture says uh, that Jesus would build his church, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and only those in his body would make it to heaven. So yes, uh, about all this, a serious-minded person would say, I must find the church of the Bible. Got to find the church of the Bible. See uh, which, which one is actually teaching the truth, because only Jesus' church, whatever he established, that's what's going to heaven. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 says that God the Father, he gave him, Jesus, to be head over all things to the church, one church, which is his body. Jesus' body is the church. So Jesus' church is called the body of Christ, right? The body of Christ is called the church of Christ, biblically. There's only one body, there's only one church. Well, and listen to Ephesians 4.4. 4. It says plainly, there is one body. Well, what was the body? It was the church. How many churches are there? There's one church. Uh, Ephesians 5.23 follows this up. says Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of that body. He's saving the church. So we've got to get in what? We've got to get in the church. Uh, when, when the Bible says Jesus is only saving his body, he's saving only his, the church that he set up. Every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Matthew chapter 15, verse 13. So if you're studying with a real sense of urgency, then you'll very quickly realize, I've got to get into Christ's body, his church, if I want to be saved. Now, thought number five then goes along with this, because it happens at the same time. I must access the remission of sin. If you wound up in torments and if you got a second chance, you would realize only one thing with certainty. I ended up in that dreadful place 
because sin was evidently still on my soul. It was not removed. It was not remitted. So one way or another, I failed. To access what the Bible talks about is this remission of sins. I didn't have it. I didn't have it at the time that I died. I died with my sins on me. John chapter 8, verse 24 says, You'll die in your sins. Uh, the logical question that someone would start asking when realizing that they are lost spiritually is truly the most important question in the world. What must I do to be saved? Well, what do I got to do? The idea in Scripture is all right, I'm lost. I get it. I have the sins of my past tainting my soul still. They're still on me. How can I get those sins blotted out? Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. What must I do to be saved? The Bible makes it abundant, abundantly clear what a sinner has to do to be saved. Uh, you go ask a bunch of churches, they'll make it confusing. The Bible is very, very plain on it. Jesus said in Matthew uh, chapter 16 verse 16, and actually, that should be Mark 16, 16, now that I'm up here preaching it. Mark 16, 16. He who, I was like, man, that's a, the, the, upon this rock, I'll build my church section. But this is uh, Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Well, what do you got to do? Believe and get baptized. Believe this message. Um, follow the instructions to be reborn in the waters of baptism. The rebirth, John chapter 3 and verse 5. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter this kingdom of God. And so quite often we study the entry process into the kingdom, involving being reborn in the Spirit and being immersed in the water, so baptism to access the kingdom. That's how you're, you're, you're baptized in. So God put the kingdom door in the waters of baptism through repentance by which it could be entered. You don't get in without baptism. Nobody ever entered the body of Christ any other way. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 talks about the one body and it says, For by one Holy Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Right? Okay, Christians, you're dwelling safely in the body of Christ, which is his church. How did you get in? Well, we were baptized into the one body. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's how you get in. Oh, but repentance is talked about too. As well as the conf as confession of the name of Christ. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter said to the sinners on that day how they needed to access the blood of Jesus Christ. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. There it is, remission of sins. You do this, you'll get your remission of sins. That's what we're looking for. That's why we went to torments in our scenario that's how we gain access to the removal of our sins. Repent and be baptized. Believe in Jesus. And you'll receive this awesome gift from the Holy Spirit. Here's how you get the remission of sins. So if someone got their second chance after they spent time in Hades, they'd come back to these verses and say, I can't believe it was really just this simple the whole time. That's all it was. All I had to do to gain access to the cleansing was believe, repent, confess the name of Christ, and be baptized. Wow, God's word was teaching me about this the whole time, but I never listened. I never opened it up. Someone taught me wrong, but I didn't read it for myself. God's word talked about repenting from my sin, but I never pursued that concept. I didn't try to live any differently. Repentance is just a, a change of mind about the way you've been living. I used to practice the deeds of darkness. And that was my lifestyle, living in sin. Now I'm going to turn away from that lifestyle and I'm going to live a different lifestyle. Right? That's the rebirth. You're going to be a new person. That's repentance. I know I'll never be perfect, but to repent means to change my life's path toward righteousness. So number five, an urgent soul would say, I have to access this forgiveness of sins. And if they had not yet obeyed the gospel, they'd do so right away. In Acts chapter 16, uh, the, the Philippian jailer heard this information in the middle of the night when it was preached to him. And he by no means waited until morning. Acts chapter 16, 33 says, And the Philippian jailer uh, took him the same hour of the night and washed his stripes, and immediately he and his family were baptized. In the middle of the night. Right, that's urgency. Uh, he, he came across the information that, that told him, Oh, I, I'm still in my sins right now. And he did it right away. He said, Well, i got to take care of it. I might not make it till morning. Ananias told Paul, who was down on his knees praying when he got there, Acts 22, verse 16, says, And now why are you waiting? 
What are you waiting on? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Don't wait any longer to do it. If a person really visited the place of torments and came back, this would be the urgency that they'd have. And you'd be baptized and repent as quickly as humanly possible. And the water is ready today, by the way. Oh, but then upon studying God's word, we also see the importance then of number six. Number five was I must access the remission of my sins. Number six is then I must maintain the remission of my sins. Once I've accessed it. So contrary to popular, popular belief of the false doctrine of once saved, always saved, the Bible teaches that a soul, once baptized, can fall from grace again if they're not faithful to God. And so thus, this question becomes just as important as, as, important as our last question. How, how do I stay saved once I get saved? That's a, that's a question. Well, I'm glad you asked. The Bible makes that plain and simple as well. In order to maintain the blood of Jesus Christ, which you accessed at your baptism, the biblical command is just remain faithful. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. The implication here says, hey, now that you're baptized, you've accessed my blood, now be faithful until death, and then I will give you the crown of life. Biblically, the term faithful merely means to adhere to the new covenant to the best of your ability. The implication is just a lifestyle of obedience. You're trying your very best to keep the laws of God. You're putting forth a diligent effort to do right. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 talks about the disqualification that can come when Christians go around sinning all the time on purpose. Uh, the Bible says, for if we go on sinning willfully, saying, wow, I can just sin all I want. Now I got the grace of God after we've received the knowledge of the truth. It says there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. You go about just sinning on purpose all the time. It's not going to work. We have to actually be sorry. Try not to live that life. And you will have access, continual access, to the forgiveness of sin. Of course, elsewhere, we're told what to do uh, when Christians do slip up into sin. The Bible says, hey, once you're baptized into Christ, you slip up again. You've got to pray to God. Acts chapter 8, verse 22. Repent again and confess the sin before God. John chapter 1, verse 9. So if we try living our best, According to his laws, we fess up when we fall short. First John 1 John 1.9 says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins when we fall short and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can keep yourself cleansed with his blood if after baptism you just remain faithful and you fess up when you fall short. That's how it works. Don't go about sinning all the time. You'll be disqualified. But if you walk in the light, Jesus' blood keeps on cleansing you from all sin. First John chapter 1 and verse 7. So to the person who came back from torments and realized, hey, you know, I, I had been baptized before. I've already been baptized. I still ended up in the place of torments. What gives? I did everything I was supposed to except uh, I, I wasn't living faithfully. I was baptized, but I wasn't living faithfully. And I ended up in torments. I had been going uh, through, I had been going through a time frame claiming to be a Christian. But I was just sinning on purpose over and over. I wasn't sorry about it. I wasn't confessing it to God. I wasn't trying not to, to do this sin. And then what, what was going on is the blood of Jesus Christ no longer was benefiting me because I was just sinning on purpose. I should have repented of my error. I should have stopped the course of living I was on because I already had access to the blood of Christ. I gained that at my baptism, but I disqualified myself. Paul said, lest when I preach to others, I myself could be disqualified. So you can be disqualified once you gain it at your baptism. But now I realize this. I have my chance. I have not gone to the place of torment yet. I'm going to fix my life. I'm going to make sure I live the Christian life. We'll close with point number seven, which is perhaps probably the most powerful point. If you come back from torments in Hades, then you should naturally say this also. I must warn others about this horrible place. I love others. I don't want them to go there. And this is an, an overall love for humanity that we're supposed to have. This was the response even of the rich man who ended up in torments himself, right? After he realized the severity of this place, uh, and at first, after pondering his own situation, 
said, well, I understand I'm not making it out of this place. Who do you think about? He said, I have five brothers back on earth. And because I, I care about them, because I have concern for their eternal well-being, they're living just like I was, someone's got to go tell them about this place of torment. When we fully understand how awful this place is, a place of separation from God, then part of our life's goal will not only to be to make sure that we make it ourselves, but to help make sure everybody else that we're, we come to contact with can make it to heaven too. Thus, we preach the gospel to every creature. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. So yes, luckily, as we stated earlier, exactly this. We don't have to see torments with our own eyes to understand we don't want to go there. And we don't have to go to torments to understand these seven truths that we studied today. Because we can see torments right now in understanding. Torments is real. The place we discussed this morning is real. And heaven is also real. And just as assuredly as you don't want to go to the place of torments, you sure will enjoy heaven. And it's just the best place the Bible could possibly describe. And we want... Uh, we want you to know about the good news. So you can go to heaven. You don't have to go to the place of torment. You don't have to end up in hell. So if you're not ready to die today, Jesus could come back at any moment. We could die at any time. Our life is fragile. <coughs> the invitation is yours. The water's ready. If anybody needs to be baptized today and make the commitment to Jesus Christ, we can do it today. We can accommodate. Uh, have a seat on the front row or talk to me afterwards as we stand and as we sing.